All right, well, let's begin. Lord, we're grateful for our time together today, and we just ask now that you would bless our study of your word, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our minds, Lord, that we might hear and see and receive that which you would have for us today. We thank you, Lord, for the example of your grace and your mercy in, Lord, the reality of your judgment also. So we commit our time to you, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So here we find... Uh, this is the story, the first part of 1 Samuel chapter 14 is the story of Jonathan and his armor bearer. Jonathan and his armor bearer, the faith of Jonathan and the loyalty of his armor bearer as they take on the Philistines on their own for the second time in two chapters. And just by way of an introduction, you know, in chapters 12 and 13, in chapter 12, uh, Samuel gives his farewell address and it reminds Israel of, of, uh, of his own faithfulness. He says, I've been faithful. I haven't I haven't dishonored the Lord. I've done everything that I promised you that I would do. And uh, he said, the Lord is my witness and, and his anointed is witness this day that you've not found anything in my hand. Um, but then he reminds Israel of God's promise to them, but it was a conditional promise that he would bless them and he would give them victory if they just did one thing. What was that? Obey his commandments and honor him. But it says in 1 Samuel 12 uh, that they forgot the Lord their God and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, the commander of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines. And they cried to the Lord and they said, we have fought against them. And they, um, uh, they, cr they cried to the Lord, we have uh, sinned because we have forsaken the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. And then they asked the Lord, now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies. And so... Um, and so um, in verse 12, in, in chapter 12, it says, and when, you, and when you saw that Nahash, king of the Amorites, came against you, you said to me, no, but a king shall reign over us when the Lord your God was your king. So here um, we, we reminded, Samuel's reminded uh, the nation of Israel that God was their king, but you wanted a king. So, um, so now behold, uh, the king you have chosen, which was whom? Saul. Saul was the, that they, they, the Lord has chosen, but the nation asked for them. Um, the king that you, whom you have chosen, for whom, for whom you have asked, behold, the Lord has set a king over you. If you will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the, against the commandments of the Lord, and if both you and the king who reign over you will follow the Lord your God, it will be well. But if you do will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you your king. Well, what happens with Saul? The very next chapter, um, uh, what does he do? He goes and makes an offering. Uh, he's supposed to wait for Saul, if you recall, in chapter 14. For how long? Seven days. And, and at the end of seven days, uh, or after, the, after seven days, which really meant, uh, I'll come sometime after the seventh day. But Saul couldn't wait for Samuel to come and to offer a, a, a burnt offering on his behalf so that the Lord would give him victory. Um, in his fight against the Philistines. So what does Saul do? Do you remember when chapter 14, uh, Pete covered last week? He does the offering on his own. He offers a burnt offering. Um, he says, I couldn't wait. I, 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 had to do, I had to do this. I was compelled to do it. And Samuel says, what have you done? And the, and the consequences of that were, were pretty severe. Uh, Samuel says to him in chapter 14, and verse 13, he says, And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not commit, uh, kept the commandment of the Lord. Remember, we just said in chapter 13, Samuel had told him, If you and your king obey the Lord. Now Samuel is saying, You have not obeyed the commandment of the Lord in which, uh, which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now you, your king... Shall, your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, who was whom? David. God had already chosen him. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. Now, how long had Saul been king? Saul had been king probably about two years, two to three years at this time. So he's just barely getting started in his, in his kingship and his, the kingdom is taken from him. The promise of the kingdom is taken from him. Now he goes on and stays king for a while, just as uh, uh, Eli's priesthood continued for a couple generations, three generations. 
Uh, but God has said, your kingdom will not endure. So now we come to chapter 14. If you recall, uh, chapter 13 ends with Israel literally having no spears or swords. How did that happen? Uh, God had promised them victory, in, in, as we'll see over and over again. And yet, here they are, uh, all they have are their plowshares and their axes, but they have no, they, they have no, no swords. Well, they had, uh, in, the, in somewhere along the way in their battles with the Philistines, they had lost their swords. But we can safely assume that uh, they had fled in terror, uh, probably dropping their swords and their armor as they ran from the Philistines. You remember they were out, outnumbered tremendously. Um, in chapter uh, 13, um, it, tell, it starts out by saying that Saul had 3,000 soldiers with him. Now, he had vastly more than that, but he had taken 3,000 soldiers with him to this little outpost called Michmash um, out in the desert where he was going to take on the Philistines. And he, um, he, took, he kept 2,000 of those soldiers for himself, and he gave 1,000 to his son Jonathan to fight with. And, uh, they, and Jonathan went out, and he, if you recall, he won the battle with the Philistines, this garrison of the Philistines. And um, so what does Saul do? Do you remember? He makes this big announcement that Israel has won a great, great battle today. And basically, he took the credit for Jonathan's victory. Um, but meanwhile, Jonathan had won this battle over a small segment, a, a garrison of the, uh, of the Philistines. Meanwhile, they had about either 30,000 or 3,000, depending on the translation, there's some confusion about what that number is, but it vastly outnumbered uh, the, they vastly outnumbered the, uh, the uh, Saul's army. So what did they do? They ran in terror and they hid in caves um, and in the hillsides. And some were even so afraid that they went across the Jordan. Now think about, think about this for a minute. Saul's soldiers, some of them went back across the Jordan. Now, wait a minute, isn't that the same Jordan? that God led the nation of Israel across after 40 years in the wilderness? Wasn't this the same Jordan that, they, that Joshua crossed and they set up these stones when they got on the other side as a remembrance of God's faithfulness? And God promised them that they would give them this land? So what happens to these soldiers? They go back across the Jordan to hide out because they're fearful of the Philistine army. Uh, it's a sad story, it truly is. And so they were probably running in fear from the Philistine army dropping their swords and their shields as they went. They had no, they had no swords or shields. So meanwhile, uh, we now know that, that Saul's army has now dwindled down to 600 men that are hiding in these caves that stayed with them. The rest had deserted, ran away across the Jordan, hidden in other places along the hillsides. And Saul now had 600 men, 1,400 of them hundred of them either died in combat or had deserted. So now we come to chapter 14. Let's read the first 15 verses. It says in uh, beginning in verse one, one day Jonathan, the son of Saul said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Jebeah in the pomegranate cave at Migron. And the people who were there with him were about 600 men, including Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, son of Phinehas, son of Eli, the priest of the Lord in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. With, within the passes by which Jonathan, Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on the other one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was uh, Bozes and the name of the other was Shenna. And one crag rose on the north in front of Michmash, and on the other on the south in front of Geba. Verse 6, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by, man, by many or by few. His armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. And if they say to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, Come to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign to us, 
So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines, and the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of their holes where they have hidden themselves. And the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come to us and we will show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet, and his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan, and his armor bearer killed, him, killed them after him. And that first strike, which Jonathan and his armor bearer made, killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among the people, all the people. And gar the garrison and even the raiders trembled, and the earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. This is one of the most interesting stories that we find in the Old Testament. It's fascinating. Jonathan is, is now the second time taking on a garrison of the Philistines. And as we see, he's going to win the battle. Actually, we're going to see who actually wins the battle. But uh, Jonathan is one bold guy. Uh, he, he is brave. He's bold. Uh, the contrast with his father is striking. You know, we've all heard the expression, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, let me assure you uh, that this apple fell about two miles away. Uh, there was no resemblance. You have a fearful, um, kind of uh, emotionally unstable uh, uh, king that is all about himself. And he plays religiosity uh, from time to time, and it works in his favor. But when he feels like he's outnumbered, what does he do? Hides in the cave. Uh, he takes credit when he can. But in meanwhile, he's not going to have anything to do with him unless he thinks that uh, religion somehow will save him. We're going to find that. But, but Jonathan, he says, I'm not staying in this cave. I'm not going to hang out here uh, while the Philistines are over the hill. Uh, I'm going to take them on again. Now, so he takes on this garrison. Now, garrison, we don't know how many there were. Um, we know he kills, as we just read, 20, 20 of them with his armor bearer. But beyond that, there was a whole garrison. The garrison could have been anywhere from 100 to 200, 300 uh, soldiers that were in there. We just really don't know for sure. But one thing we do know in verse 1 is one day, I don't know how long they've been in these caves, but it had been too long for Jonathan. The son of Saul, Jonathan, said to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Now, so Jonathan's, uh, Saul is continuing to hide out, hide out in his pomegranate cave, and Jonathan decides he's going to take on the Philistines on his own. He doesn't tell his father. Why do you think, class, why doesn't he tell his father he's going to go after the garrison of the Philistines? His father wouldn't go for this, right? Two reasons, okay? One, he <coughs> probably cared about Jonathan. Uh, he, you know, it seemed to him impossible odds. He's already figured this out. That's why he's hiding. It could have been as many as 30,000 in the army uh, about 10 or 20 miles away. This garrison was an outpost. Um, or it just could be that he was a little worried because the last time this happened, previous chapter, Jonathan won. He was staying back. Jonathan won with his 1,000 thousand, thousand soldiers. Solomon was hanging back with his 2,000. Jonathan won the battle. He has to take the credit. He doesn't want that to happen again. Well... So anyway, that's probably some combination of those two things. But uh, for sure, Saul didn't, 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 want, to, didn't want to look bad. Um, with Jonathan taken off, but just now, not a thousand, but just his armor bearer. Now we're going to find that his relationship with his armor bearer was unique also. So Saul was staying in the outskirts, verse 2, uh, of Gibeah, not to be confused with Giba in the pomegranate cave at Migron. And the people were with, who were with him were about 600 men, which we already covered all that, including, interestingly, Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother. Now, what relationship would that make him to, to, to Eli, his great-grandson? Okay, uh, So he's the grandson of, of Phinehas. What happened to Phinehas? Uh, he was killed in battle in judgment for... Uh, for him and uh, uh, um, defaming or blaspheming the name of the Lord with, his, with um, um, blaspheming and um, the, the name of the Lord in his offerings. And so Saul again is hiding with his 600 men. And in, who's he hiding with here? He's hiding with um, uh, Ahijah, the great grandson of, of, of Eli. And um, 
So um, you recall, of course, I already mentioned that, that his great-grandfather's priestly lineage, lineage was determinated by the Lord. Why? Because he had tolerated his son's blasphemy, uh, Phinehas and Hophni, if you recall. Uh, he tolerated their blasphemy, so uh, the, their, his priestly line was terminated by the Lord. Um, and, of course, Phinehas and Hophni were killed in battle for their gross sin. So, um, by the way... Um, You'll find that the Lord says, for, if we went back to uh, 1 Kings 2, I mean, 1 Samuel 2, we won't take time to go there. But the Lord told um, Eli that your, that your priesthood would not continue, that it would not go on. It did go on for three more generations until, uh, until uh, Solomon became king. And when Solomon became king, he, he terminated... Um, the line of uh, Abiathar, who was uh, of the line of Eli, and he made Zadok the, uh, the, the priest. So uh, we'll cover that another time. But um, what we find here is that why, do you, why in this passage is it you know, that Saul is with hiding out in the cave. He's with how many soldiers? 600. 600. And who do they call out? He, he, he calls out... Uh, he calls out um, Abijah, why? The, the great-grandson of Eli. Well, it says that he, had a, that he was wearing a, an ephod. Now, the ephod was this garment over which they had this vest, and in they had a couple pockets in them. In the pockets, they had the, two of these stones. What were they called? Urim and the Thummim, right? right? And uh, they, they, they either were some means of, of, of a, a lots or, or straws, as it were, or um, they, they, some speculate that these change colors. Um, and they, when, when uh, um, the priests sought direction from the Lord. Um, we'll see in this context, it looks like they, there was a means for them to draw lots. So we'll cover that a little bit more. So it calls them out. Um, that uh, Ahijah, the son of ah ah Ahitub, that's, that's who he's calling out. But what's interesting about this is, not only is he wearing this ephod, but wait a minute, the priesthood has already been told of this line, uh, Eli, that, he would, that the priesthood would end. But he's still wearing his priestly garments. He's still going after it. But we know that the lineage was corrupted. So who's, who is Ahijah with? None other than Saul hiding in the caves. You know, it just reminds me that, uh, you know, 1 Corinthians 15, 53, it says, uh, do not be deceived, uh, bad company corrupts good morals, right? Uh, you know, Saul wasn't real discerning on who he chose to be with him. It's, it's just interesting. More, more Saul. Uh, am I picking on Saul? <laughs> maybe, maybe, the, maybe Saul, it's just, that's who he was. Um, so it kind of brings everything he does into suspicion, does it not? In any case... Uh, what we find in verse 4 now is within these passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines uh, garrison, there was this rocky crag on one side and the rocky crag on the other. The one was named Bozes and the other rock was named Shenna. And the one crag grow, uh, rose to the north in front of Michmash, um, which is where the, where the full army of the, uh, of the uh, um, Philistines was, and the other on the south side from Geba. So... This, this text is setting up this classic scouting scene. Um, it it kind of reminds you of the, uh, it's a much, much smaller version of the famous Ky Kyber Pass. Anybody remember the Kyber Pass uh, the, the, from, from uh, Pakistan into uh, Afghanistan? And through, throughout the centuries, the armies would march through the Kyber Pass. And it has all these hillsides on both sides. And if you can, and the armies would, the, the opposing armies would be there, and there would be ambushes and great battles happen, and all that happening. In any case, um, um, this is a really small, ver small version of that. Um, the rocky crags they they naturally guarded the passage between uh, the caves where Saul was hiding and the Philistine garrison about ten miles to the east, and and then beyond that, Michmash, where the full Philistine army was uh, was based. And from there, uh, Jonathan in his, uh, up on this crag, Jonathan and his armor bearer could have a clear view of the Philistine encamp encampment. Um, and uh, these crags were just an opening in this long ridge that went for miles on either side. Uh, uh, some archaeologists 
uh, <laughs> believe that they've identified as this actual line, uh, ridges that went along here um, outside of Jerusalem now. Um, but um, in any case, they had this clear view from up on this crag. They climbed up there and there was a cleft of some kind where they could see. They still had a ways to climb, but they somehow could see. We're not sure exactly how this all works. But uh, so Jonathan says to, his, to the young man who carried his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison. This is verse six of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us for nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. And his armor bearer said to him, do all is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you, heart and soul. This is one of the great verses in you know, all of Scripture. I love this verse. He says, Behold, I'm with you, heart and soul. And uh, I'm with you all the way. No matter what happens, I'm loyal to you. It's, it's a great story, and, uh, and we'll get into that a little bit more. And then verse 8 says, And Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men, and we will show ourselves to them. So picture this. We're going to stand up in the opening uh, of this um, of this pass so that the, the Philistine garrison can see us. And um, he says, if they say to us, wait, we will come to you, then we will stand in our place and we will not go to them. Now, what that means is we're not going to engage them. Okay. But in verse 10, it says, but if they say, come up to us, then we will go up for the Lord has given them into our hand and this shall be the sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison uh, the garrison of the Philistines. By the way, when he says, we will go up to them, now we're, they're already up, okay? So they're actually, we would say they could go down to them, but he says go up because it's the north, okay? So that's kind of like, guys, we would say we're going north, we're going up. Uh, gals, sorry, I'm being sexist. <laughs> yes, we're going to go down the hill, you know, and both are right, but that's what's going on here, okay? Um, so so just, as his, just as with his father Saul, Jonathan's true character is now on display, um, uh, we see that loud and clear. Um, he says, let's go over to the uncircumcised Philistines. And when he says the uncircumcised Philistines, what he's saying is those pagan, godless foreigners. And he says, maybe the Lord will work for us. Now, when he says, maybe the Lord will work for us, it's, it's more like a rhetorical question. Uh, it's not like, oh, I hope the Lord might work for us. He says, no, the Lord is going to work for us. If he leads us to do this, he's going to work for us. And so... Um, He's not engaging in this like empty bluster. He's not setting himself up to be this potential hero. You know, notice here, Jonathan's focus is on the Lord, is it not? This, this is what the, he's, it's always talking about the Lord. Lord, Lord, if he will give it to us, the Lord will show us if we should engage. We're going to trust the Lord. And if he, and if he leads us into get, to engage the battle with this garrison, he'll give us the victory. This is not about me. This is all about the Lord. And he recognized himself as the instrument of the Lord. Of the Lord. How, what a great contrast that is with Saul, hiding out in the cave with his corrupted priest. So um, it's, it's and notice here he says uh, he, he, that um, he's not simply saying to his armor bearer that, that if God intends to give them a victory, it won't, it won't matter. What he's saying is, it doesn't matter if God intends to give them the victory. It won't matter whether it's just the two of us or an entire army. Said by many or by few. So, interesting, this is an allusion to his father. He said, uh, by many, my dad, with his 600 and hiding in the caves, uh, or by few, uh, armor bearer, that's you and me, uh, doesn't matter if God is going to give the victory, he'll give the victory against overwhelming odds. It doesn't seem possible. Did, I, I read this report this morning of the Minnesota Vikings. Is that it? The, the biggest come from behind in the history of football? I don't know how far back football goes, but anyway. <laughs> uh, they, you know, they, were, they were down 33 to nothing at halftime. It, they, the, the, the odds makers gave them a point zero two chance, you know, uh, and um, if you were a betting person, that would have been a good time to bet on the Vikings. Who are they playing? It's not, I don't remember what team. But anyway, they come from behind and they win in overtime. It's impossible. But they did. Uh, this is kind of that situation times how many, right? And this wasn't like playing football. This is playing life and death. And so um, nothing phased Jonathan. I, I'm so impressed with this guy. He just shows up in chapter 13 for the first time. 
Here we are in chapter 14. He's doing the same thing again. Um, he says in verse 6, look here, he says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. So Jonathan's faith suggests that he, that he knew the Holy Scriptures too, that, that he trusted God, the God of Israel, that he knew God's promises. You remember Deuteronomy 20? Well, you will when well, I read it to you. But in Deuteronomy 20, beginning in the first verse, it says, the, Moses is giving instruction to the, to the armies of Israel. And he says, when you go out to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and army larger than your own, does this sound familiar? You shall not be afraid of them, for the Lord your God is with you, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. And when you draw near to the battle, the priest shall come forward and speak to the people and say to them, Hear, O Israel, today you are drawing near for battle against your enemies. Let not your heart faint. Do not fear or panic, nor be in dread of them. For the Lord your God is he who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies, to give you victory. Now, you think Jonathan was remembering this? Jonathan almost certainly knew the scripture. He had heard the scriptures, and he knew God's promise. He understood that any victory that he could hope for would not come by his own hands. It would come by the hand of the Lord, just as he did with Jonathan, Jonathan uh, and with Joshua, and, and of course later with King, King David. We see this pattern over and over and over again. Uh, God's promises, God's God's reminders. I'll give you victory. There's only one condition. We've been over this in this class over and over again already, haven't we? What's the one condition? That you obey my commandments. That's all you have to do. That you honor me, I'll give you victory. We find this in the life of David now, um, years later, not that many years later. Um, let me just read you a few verses about King David. In 2 Samuel uh, 8, 6, Then David put garrisons in Aram and of Damascus, and the Syrians became the servants of David and brought tribute, and the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. In 2 Samuel 8, 14, the same chapter, then, the, then he put garrisons in Edom throughout all Edom, and he put garrisons in all the Eden, Edomites, became David's servants, and the Lord gave victory to David wherever he went. In 2 Samuel 23, 10, he arose and struck down the Philistines, this is David, until his hand was weary and his hand clung to the sword, and the Lord brought about a great victory that day. Now, um, and then um, 2 Samuel 23, 12, but he took his stand in the midst of the plot and uh, defended it and struck down the Philistines and the Lord worked a great victory. Now, all these victories against the Philistines that we find recorded here were done, came about how? By the hand of the Lord. The Lord worked a great victory. The Lord gave victory. The Lord gave victory. The Lord gave a great victory. It's what we find over and over again. So what we find here is now a preview of David mirrored in Jonathan's life. Is it any surprise at all that Jonathan and David became best friends? I mean, they, 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 they were kindred spirits, were they not? In fact, what we find here is kind of a preview in Jonathan of David's uh, victory over Goliath. And see if you can see the parallels here. It's just fascinating. Um, so now we find that we come to the armor bearer. And again, the armor bearer in verse 7 says, His armor bearer said to him, Do all that's in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you. How? Heart and soul. Heart and soul. I'm with you, heart and soul. I'm with you all the way. I am going to be by your side. You don't have to worry. I'll not leave you. Now, we don't even know the name of this armor bearer, but I like this guy a lot. Uh, He's a perfect example of the quiet, brave, essential servant of the Lord who is content to stay in the background and faithfully supporting those who are out front. Now, how many in this church are in the background? How many uh, in, in this church are willing just to do the work that needs to be done? If you come early on a Sunday morning, try coming an hour early or a half an hour early. What are you going to see? A swarm of people running around this church setting things up and uh, getting, getting the kiosk all set up and moving all the chairs all around and setting up, get, getting ready for the uh, for music. The music team's here at what? 6.30, 6:30 in the morning. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Don't you love it? Bless your heart. 
Uh, they don't look at, they're not looking for thanks, thank you. Uh, they, they're, not, you know, they're not expecting people to say, oh, thank you for coming at 6.30 and setting these things up. They just, they're just here. They're, they're just armor bearers. They don't, they don't need the, the credit. They're just willing to support and make things happen that otherwise could never happen. So they're content. Um, they never demand or expect that recognition. So the armor bearer is one of those, one of those people who literally does the heavy lifting. He's carrying Jonathan's armor. It's what armor bearers do, right? They bear the armor. How much do you think that armor weighs? Well, we don't know for sure, but remember when uh, they tried to put the armor on, on, on David when he's going to take on Goliath, and it's like, like this, weighing him down. He's like, I can't do this. Takes it off. Probably weighs 30, 40, 50 pounds, just the armor itself, maybe more. And so here we have the armor bearer lugging the armor along with David's sword. We know that David and Saul both had swords, right? Uh, nothing about the armor bearer having a sword, but the swords are probably, you know, three, four feet long and weighing like 15, 20 pounds. You've got to be a big dude to handle these things. So here we have the awkward to carry. So you can see, you know, the armor bearer's doing this because it says he was a young man. We read that earlier, right? And he's, and he's going, trudging along up this hillside, actually the steep cliff following and caring for, um, for Jonathan. Why? Because he wanted Jonathan, the armor bearer, wants, wants their leader to be fresh, not worn out carrying armor. Of course, he, meanwhile, he's exhausted, right? Um, so um, kinda, it's kind of like, uh, you know, why, why do professional golfers have caddies? You know, they're not allowed to ride in carts, are they? Um, they have to walk the entire distance. What is it, about three miles in an 18 hole? And um, uh, the caddy has to carry their, carry their uh, uh, clubs the whole way. Well, it's not because the, the, um, the professional golfer is, is all that lazy. Uh, there's probably a little bit of that going on, but the reality is they need to be fresh at every stroke. They've got to be fresh. And um, well, that's the, so the, the, the caddy is there to save a stroke or two, right, in the course of a game. The armor bearer is there to save a life. And so that's what's going on here. Um, so the, the narrative doesn't explicitly tell us that Jonathan asked the armor bearer's opinion, by the way. We're not told that. Um, uh, but this suggests, the context suggests that uh, the relationship was such that Jonathan expected a response and he, and he got the strongest response that he could ever expect to get. You know, he, the, 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 the armor bearer um, said to him, do all that's in your heart. Well, why did he say that? Because Jonathan probably turned to him just like the pro golfer turns to his caddy and says, how do you read this lie? You know, uh, what do you think, armor bearer? There was a close relationship there. And he said, hey, I'm with you. I'm, do all that's in your heart. I'm with you, heart and soul. Um, I don't know about you, but if I needed someone's wholehearted support, encouragement, um, I'd, I'd take that armor bearer anytime. How about you? Well, actually, I have one. Her name is Cindy. And <laughs> she doesn't carry my army, but she carries everything else. <laughs> and she always tells me, I'm with you, heart and soul, and I love you too. She says that all the time, like 50 times a day. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's kind of that relationship. But, you know, Proverbs 18:24. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. It's kind of that relationship, you know? So uh, now we come to verse 8, and Jonathan said, Behold, we'll cross over to the men, that's to the garrison, and we will show ourselves to them. And if they say to us, remember, wait until we come, then we will stand in our place. And uh, uh, think of it this way, we'll stand down, and we will not go up to them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has given them into our hand, and this shall be the sign for us. So he already knows. I know how this battle is going to end. And God has promised, and God is going to give it if God leads us to go into battle. So, um, so um, we don't know whether, where Jonathan got this idea that if we, that if we show ourselves and they, and they say, come up, that we'll, that we'll come up to you that we're going to stand down, we're not going to engage the battle, but if they say, come on down to us, that uh, we will go into battle, uh, we don't know where that guy came from, but the Lord had revealed that to Jonathan, put that in his heart. And, um, but we, so we know this, this faith of Jonathan is pretty amazing. Uh, and he, then he goes on just to reinforce it, and he says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. 
You know, doesn't matter whether it's me with my armor bearer or Saul, my father, with his 600, doesn't matter. If God is, is in this, he will give us the victory. And we think about that more and more. As I think about that um, more and more in this crazy world we're in, where it's becoming increasingly clear that the world hates Christians, right? If you are a believer, um, you, you are a hate, you're a hateful person. You, we're told that every day. We hear that every day. Um, but, you know, so God, Jonathan would not be phased by that. It doesn't matter whether all these smart guys, these wealthy people that, that hate the church, that think it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. If God is going to give the victory, God is going to give the victory. It doesn't matter by many or by few. Yeah, we hear amen. amen. It's, the, it, it's just amazing. And I want to be like, John, I, I'll, settle by being, I'll settle for being like the armor bearer. How about you? I'll just take that kind of faith. So it's unprecedented. We, so the, the key words here is the Lord has given them into our hands. Um, so as usual, I went way ahead of my, of my notes. <laughs> we don't know for sure what Jonathan was thinking, but you know, God had shown himself faithful in these situations before. Uh, you, you remember a guy, I had to look it up because I'd forgotten. Remember a guy named Shagmar? Nobody remembers Shagmar. Oh, well, who would, right? He's the guy that killed 600 Philistines with an ox goat. Because that come to mind now? Uh, and that was in Judges chapter 3. And when we see this over and over again, a God giving victory. Jonathan knew his scripture, so, and he knew his history. So they show themselves to the Philistines. They probably climbed up to this cleft in the, in the rock, this opening, not all the way up uh, where they could be seen. And they showed themselves in verse 11 to the, to the garrison. And um, the Philistine says, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden themselves. Verse 12, and the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan, his armor bearer, and said, come on up to us and we'll show you a thing. And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. So uh, what did they do? They didn't say, we're going to come up to you. They say, come on down. We're going to show you a thing. That's, that's kind of like saying, hey, um, it, it, they were just almost like uh, one commentator says, it's almost like they were engaging in banter with them. You know, hey, you up there, come on down. They're thinking that these guys are, are a couple more deserters. You know, they're tired of hanging out in caves. They want to come over to their side. Come on down. We'll show you around the, we'll show you around the camp. We'll, we'll have a good time together. That's kind of like the, 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 these guys were thinking. They had no idea that Jonathan and, and the armor bearer were claiming God's promise of victory. They just come on down. So what happens? They climb the remainder of the way up this, this steep incline. It says, you know, they climbed literally on their, uh, with their hands and their feet. And um, the Philistines had sent out a party to meet them, not the whole garrison, about 20 of them. Uh, uh, and uh, they were probably thinking, hey, these are deserters. They were probably lightly armed. We're not sure. But uh, they sure weren't prepared to engage in battle. They just thought they were going to take a couple prisoners um, or more traitors to their cause. Either way, they weren't prepared. So it says in verse 13, Jonathan climbed up on his hands and his feet and his armor bearer after them, and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer and killed them after them. And, and that first strike, verse 14, with Jonathan, his armor bearer, made, killed about 20 men with him, as it were, half a furrow's, furrow's length in an acre of land. So, and there was panic in the camp and in the field and among the people and the garrison, even the raiders trembled and the earth quaked and became a great, very great panic. So what happened is this welcoming party, welcoming these traitors or these prisoners, turned into a slaughter. There were two now initially against 20. Um, and um, it's 10 to 1 odds, but the Lord had already won the battle. He'd already given them into, his, into their hand. That's what Jonathan's point of view. He says, come up after me to his armor bearer. The Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. So you can to see this picture. They're, they're, they run down this, this, the other side of this, this ridge, and uh, they're in this field now, and uh, it's about an acre so just give you an idea, this property that here at the church is three acres. So it's pretty good to be the entire grassy area and this building area here, this whole area here. And they're running across and in about 
the, this furrow that they're talking about is about half the acre. And so about the, in the distance of about half an acre, they kill all 20 of these Philistines, green party that had come to see them. And how many swords do they have? Well, they have one, don't we? And maybe the armor bearer carried an ax or a, or a eh, I don't think so, right? Because what, he was busy carrying what? Armor, armor right? And so he's handing the sword to, uh, to Jonathan and the armor to Jonathan, and he's there, he has nothing. So what really goes on here, we're not told, but most likely is that Jonathan runs ahead, kills the first few um, of the Philistines. They drop their swords, the, and, and the armor bearer is behind him. What's he do? Picks up the sword, and he goes after him himself. That's most likely, that we're not told the details. This is Mark's holy speculation. But, but this is kind of a scenario that most likely happened. They kill all 20 of them because it says the armor bearer, after, after uh, uh, Jonathan, killed also. So we know that for sure. Uh, and so what happens next? It says that the garrison and even the raiders trembled and the earth quaked and became a very great panic. Now they're seeing that their welcoming party is, is slaughtered in the field and they start looking at so what's going on. The whole army of Saul must be, must be right after them. They're coming after us. And all of a sudden they're fearful and they begin to panic. And, and it says that the earth quake and even the raiders trembled. Who are the raiders? Well, the raiders are either their elite forces, we're not told, or it could be some of the traitors from Israel that had come to fight with them. We're not sure, but most likely uh, the raiders were their uh, elite forces. And it says they panicked and the earthquake. Now, the earthquake here could have been earthquake, right? It could have been, I mean, God used earthquakes plenty of times in Scripture, right? I think of um, the earth opening up and swallowing, was it uh, Achan and his family? Korah. Korah, thank you. Yeah, Korah and his family. And, um, and so they, uh, God could, could have been an earthquake, could, could have given them an earthquake, or it could have been that they were stampeding around, running around in panic so much that it felt like an earthquake. Or it doesn't, but there was a great, very great panic. And um, one thing's for sure is the hand of the Lord was evident. Um, the Lord gave the victory. So now we come to Saul. S Saul has scouts out there from the caves. He's, they're checking out. Maybe they're along the ridge seeing what's going on. And they see what's going on. And, um, um, and, and Saul, meanwhile, they're not very far away, maybe a half a mile or so. They hear this commotion and they see, the scouts see the Philistines in the distance. So they go and report back to Saul. Verse 16, the scouts are called watchmen. And the watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked and behold, the multitude was dispersing here and there. They're running everywhere. Verse 17, then Saul said to the people who were with them, count and see who has gone from us. And when they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, now who is Ahijah? Remember, he's the great grandson of Eli. He's the priest with the ephod, okay? So he says to Ahijah, bring the ark here. Bring the ark of God here, for the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Uh, verse 19, now while Saul was talking to the priest, the tumult in the priest in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Now, there's a lot going on here. So we got to get the picture, get this in our mind, because it's, 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 it is Saul on steroids here. This is Saul being Saul, okay? What's he do? He, he tells the Ahijah, um, bring the ark. Now, the Septuagint says that, it's, that actually it's the ephod. And uh, that makes better sense, because remember, what was, uh, what was uh, Ahijah wearing? He was wearing the ephod. And, and the ark was at uh, Kiriath Jera, uh, you know, 40, 50 miles away. So that's the last we heard of it. So probably it's the ephod. Come over here. We need to find out what the Lord wants us to do. Should we go out and fight or should we stay here? Now, he started with the right thing, you know, to seek, to seek the guidance from the Lord. Um, but why was he doing that? Well, he saw just like the, the, um, just like, um, the um, Israeli army when they took on the Philistines back in chapter 3 and chapter 4, um, they, saw the ark, they saw the ark as this good luck charm. So he's saying, let's, let's 
check out the priest, and maybe we'll get some guidance here. But all of a sudden, he hears this tumult, this, 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 this battle going on. It's getting louder. And he says, never mind. Never mind. Uh, I'm going. Yeah, I'm going. So his idea of seeking the hand of the Lord only lasted for how long? This is a few minutes, right? He hears it, and he says to the priest, withdraw your hand. Um, I, don't, I don't need this religion stuff. I'm going into the battle. So um, uh, what, um, now, what's the point? Maybe he's legitimately in fear of Jonathan's safety. I mean, he, he, he took a little census there, and he found out Jonathan and his, his uh, armor bearer were gone, and maybe he was worried about Jonathan. I would hope so. Um, knowing his character, though, I'm wondering, it may be more like, wait a minute, there's a great battle going on, and Israel's winning, and I need to be part of that. I need to get engaged. Well, we don't, maybe it's a little bit of both. Uh, we're not sure, but we do know that now he sees the odds are in his favor. He's going to go and engage the battle. So let's get out of here. Let's get out of the caves. Let's go, and maybe we can be part of this victory. So verse 20, then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into the battle, and behold, every Philistine's sword was against his fellow, and there was great, very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time, and who had gone up with them into camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Now, let's just stop there. What happened? It's battle going on. It's chaos, earthquakes, right? And they're turning against one another in this chaos, and they're, and they're, and they're killing one another. And, um, in, and even the Israelites who were with them in the camp, who were those Israelites with them in the camp? They were the ones that had deserted. They'd gone over to the other side. Or they'd been taken prisoner, most likely the former, but maybe some combination. But all of a sudden, they turn the Israelites in the camp with them and start slaying the Philistines also. So then it says in verse 22, Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in battle. So keep in mind that Saul was in the caves, the pomegranate cave, but his army had scattered all along the ridges. They were hearing what's going on. The guys that went across the, uh, back across the Jordan, they're, they're, they get left out. But the ones that were close enough, they hear what's going on. They come out of their caves and their hiding place, and they start enjoy, engaging the battle. Um, and the hill country of Ephraim, and they heard that the Philistines were fleeing. They too followed hard after them in the battle. So verse 23, who wins? Verse 23, the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle passed beyond Beth Avon. The Lord saved Israel that day. What did Jonathan say? Jonathan says, he will give, us, he will give them into our hands. The Lord will win the battle. So, uh, and where was the armor bearer? Right in the middle of it all. He says, I'm with you, heart and soul. So, utter confusion. Um, and this is just exactly as God promised Moses. Um, if they remain faithful. Remember, again, when they were going into the promised land and God told them, um, um, uh, that he would give them victory. Um, in Exodus 23, it says in verse 27, I will send my terror before you and will throw into confusion all the people against whom you shall come and I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you. This is the promise. Jonathan remembered that promise. Joshua remembered it. Joshua was faithful. Be strong and courageous. He was faithful. So uh, if we read, um, if you go back to uh, just a few chapters, seven chapters now, in 1 Samuel chapter 7, I'll remind you in verse 10, as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that, that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion, and they were defeated before Israel. So we see the pattern. Victory after victory after victory. The Lord gave the victory when Samuel, when Jonathan, when Joshua believed God and acted on his promises and obeyed God. And Israel lost the battle over and over and over again when they tried to do it on their own and when they disobeyed the Lord. Yes, on. Um, you know, verse 
one says one day Jonathan, so it, it didn't seem like he was praying. He just seemed like one day he just got up and decided. Yes. To go. And then. Um, I, I agree with that completely. He did. I just I just saying that he believed that he knew the scripture. He yeah. knew. But then, Go ahead. And then he has this like, okay, if this happens, we'll do this, and if this happens, we'll do this. Yep. Right, so he and you say that we don't know how he just made that proclamation to his armor. That's right. We don't know. And it's it's like we can't we ourselves can't apply like if we do this, God is in it, and if we do this, God's not in it. Like how do we? Do, do you know what I'm saying? It's like oh, yes. Yeah, this is kind of like uh, Gideon's fleece, you know. Um, we don't put fleece out to determine that, you know, we don't have a urim and a thummim. You know, we don't draw lots to determine the will of the Lord. Um, what, what we have is something a whole lot better. Uh, we have the Word of God that guides us, and uh, we have the Holy Spirit who dwells every believer who leads us. Uh, yes? So, the Bible says, you know, man plans his way. Pardon? Man plans his way. Yeah, the Lord directs his steps. Yeah, yeah sorry. So, I That's right. Exactly right. Proverbs 16, 9. And the mind of man plans his ways, but the Lord directs us. It doesn't say don't plan your ways. It just said, let's keep in mind that in the midst of our planning, we turn it over to the Lord. And he's the one who will direct our spe steps. He's the one who will give us the victory. So, An, I know what you're saying. And I don't know. Um, God clearly doesn't tell us to draw straws to figure out his will today. Um, or to have holy stones or anything of the sort, he tells us that he has given us his commandments in his word. And if we obey you know, those, he will, give, he will guide us and guard us and keep us. So, um, so, um, so Saul, Saul's army, they engage. Uh, the Hebrew deserters, they turn against the Philistines. Uh, the, the soldiers in the hills are now joining the battle. Hey, we're winning, let's get in, in the action. Um, and um, once again, Saul was able to claim victory. It doesn't tell us he did, because the passage makes it very clear the Lord has already given the victory to his son. So what we find here is this is, a, this is sort of Dickinsonian a little bit. You know, it's a tale of two, two men, right? A father and a son. And um, um, we find a, a faithless, opportunistic um, father, and we find a, a faithful, um, bold, courageous, obedient son. And um, there's the contrast here. And the battle was won, not by Saul, that's for sure, and not by Jonathan, but by the Lord. And so uh, we will continue this in two weeks. So don't forget to come back. Uh, we're going to be uh, finishing up this chapter, and it's, a, it's another tragic story. It, gets, it goes from tragic to tragic -er. Uh, it's Saul making this rash vow that he doubles down on and, and ultimately that uh, cost Jonathan his life. Uh, Saul, who was concerned about his son's safety, we hope, in this passage, does something that's utterly, completely stupid and ultimately results in Jonathan's death. So now that wasn't a very happy thing to ask you to come back to here. <laughs> uh, yes, Bethany. No. Victorious. Nope. So he's banking totally on history, like what's happened before, and he's seeing the character of God and he's seeing what God tends to do in the situation, and he's putting his faith in that. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll answer the question real quickly. Um, Jonathan not only saw the history, which there's plenty of, but he, uh, there's evidence here that he actually knew the knew God's promises. The, the, the uh, Verbal tradition, you know, of, of reading scripture or even having it memorized, he had heard that over and over again. So I think he was relying upon that. He, clearly he had faith yeah. in the Lord and not of himself. We're going to wrap it up. I'm going to pray and, and uh, then we'll, we can continue the conversation. We're going to finish with the video. So Lord, we're thankful that uh, we can come this day and see this example of great faith, Lord, in Jonathan, great faith and loyalty in his armor bearer. 
Lord, help us to be like that, whether we're out front or whether we're support. Lord, may we be people, Lord, that trust you, believe you, and act upon your promises. And Lord, may we be found faithful and obedient. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.